Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Katie Baker from University of, of Utah. And she's going to be speaking about the very important but also very crowd-pleasing topic of cancer nutrition. I know as a scientist I get probably more questions about that topic than, than anything else. So, so I look forward to your talk. I'm excited to be here, and I want to thank the foundation for inviting me. Um, my name's Katie. I'm a registered dietitian, board certified in oncology, and I work at Huntsman Cancer Hospital um, in the Wellness and Integrative Health Center. Um, I think that nutrition is a big deal for um, cancer, and especially GI cancer, and um, I'm excited to, to share with you a few things. So as you know, for the survey for this conference, we asked you what you were interested to know about nutrition and cancer. And so we got a lot of different responses. And so filtering through the responses, there were sort of five themes of what you are all curious about. So make sure I know how to click this. Oh, thank you. So these were the, the top five questions that we got. So the first, what is the connection between diet and cancer? Um, what should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? Um, what should I do about side effects? And should I take supplements? So the goal is to kind of go through these questions and answer your questions. So diet and cancer, we know that nutrition plays a big role in cancer, um, and we know that people who eat a well-balanced, healthy diet with enough calories and enough protein before, during, and after treatment, they maintain their weight, they maintain their muscle and strength, um, they have more energy, they feel better, they heal faster, um, and their, their quality of life is better because they have good function. And so this is sort of the main goal as, as a dietitian when we help somebody with their nutrition is finding out where they're at in terms of calories and protein. That's the, the very most important thing is getting enough calories and protein. After that, we know that what we eat impacts cancer. Um, and so this, these are recommendations from the American Institute for Cancer Research. Um, and they recommend, you know, as a as a whole to follow a mostly plant-based diet. So plant-based meaning fruits and vegetables sort of are the most obvious in that category. Nuts and seeds would count as plant-based. Beans and legumes and lentils would also count. And it's the compounds that are found in these foods that are what's important. So plant-based foods have phytochemicals, which are kind of like um, antioxidants and vitamins and minerals, but they help protect cells from damage. And so this becomes really important for um, helping to prevent recurrence. So the goal is to have two-thirds of the diet make up some of these, or most of the diet, two-thirds be plant-based foods, and then one-third of the diet can be meats and eggs and dairy. Um, we know that there's a connection between red meat and processed meat and GI cancer. Um, red meat being an excess, maybe the heme iron is what's carcinogenic. Um, and then with processed meats being the, the chemical additives to the processed meat, the smoking and the curing, um, that's carcinogenic. We also know that there's a connection between salt and GI cancer, and the recommendation is to eat below 2,400 milligrams of salt per day, although there's no benefit from going below that, but just that's sort of the threshold is that 2,400 milligrams. Um, and then we also know that alcohol plays a role, and we're not sure if it's um, alcohol interfering with the metabolism of folate or if it's the ethanol, um, but we do know that it has an impact. And then last is body weight. And body weight impacts cancer in a number of ways, but being somebody who's above their recommended body weight, coming down to a normal body weight, and also below that those who are 
below a recommended body weight or underweight, there's benefit to gaining weight back into a healthy body weight. So the next question, foods to increase. And mainly these are plant-based foods that we want to increase. Um, so the very first one, whole grains. We're talking about brown rice, quinoa, oatmeal, cream of wheat, popcorn is a whole grain, um, barley, whole wheat tortillas, whole wheat crackers, those kinds of things. And whole grains have those same phytochemical benefits where they have those um, nutrients that it protect the cells. They're also high in fiber, which helps the bowels move regularly, but um, might be counterintuitive for someone who's struggling with diarrhea. So that would be one to tone back on if, if you're having diarrhea. Um, the next sort of obvious is fruits and vegetables. And the goal with fruits and vegetables is to eat any type. They can be fresh, they can be frozen, um, they could be canned and rinsed to get, out, get off the extra sodium. Um, they can be cooked, they can be raw, in a smoothie, in an omelet. The goal is just to try and put them in somewhere. Um, and I get it, the question a lot, well, which, which one is the best? Which fruit or vegetable or which type of beans is the best? But the answer is that it's a variety is, is the best because the different um, fruits and vegetables different colors have different phytochemicals. And so if you eat a, a wide variety of colors, then you get a different benefit from each. Um, so, excuse me, so same with beans and lentils, different types, and we're talking like red beans, black beans, pinto beans, those types of, those types of things. And the goal is to eat beans three to four times a week. Um, the next is foods with omega-3 fatty acids. And the reason why this is important is because omega-3s um, are, there's some research that suggests that they're anti-inflammatory. So they're, they're good for the body's um, immune system and good for the heart. So I've listed some foods out here that have omega-3, but mainly fish, our plant-based olive, um, or our plant-based oils like olive oil and canola oil. Um, nuts and seeds, flax seed, peanut butter, almond butter, avocados. And then the last one is herbs and spices. And so herbs and spices also have the same plant-based benefits. They also have those phytochemicals. So um, herbal tea, cooking with turmeric, and other spices like basil and oregano and rosemary and those types of things. Um, and this sort of transitions to supplement question, well, what about turmeric as a supplement? So we'll get there. Foods to decrease, we talked about processed meat. Um, and again, here's sort of a definition for you. Um, but one thing to sort of be aware with with processed meat is to try and consume it rarely, which is once a month about. Um, and reading food labels is helpful on processed meat. So we're talking about um, like salami, bacon, hot dogs, sausage, some lunch meats. So just looking at the, the food label carefully to see if um, there are chemical preservatives like nitrates and nitrites. There's really convincing research about um, processed meat being carcinogenic. So other foods to decrease, greasy and fatty foods, sugary foods like desserts and candies and soda pop. Um, and a guideline for sugary foods is to try and limit sugar to 10% of calories in a day. So a normal calorie intake, an average calorie intake is 2,000 calories a day. So that would mean it's safe to do 200 calories or less per day from something sugary. So I think I'd be in trouble because I like ice cream <laughs> and cookies. So um, f other foods to decrease alcohol and trans fats. And trans fats, um, you know, they're not always listed in the label. For example, peanut butter. If trans fats are um, 
at a certain threshold for a serving size, then companies aren't required to put it on the nutrition label. So paying attention to the ingredient list and looking for that hydrogenated word or that partially hydrogenated word means that it does have some form of trans fats. Um, although we are moving towards banning trans fats altogether here pretty soon, which will be a good thing. So one of the questions that came up a lot was the question about sugar and cancer. Um, and it's probably the question that I get asked every single day, does sugar feed cancer? Um, and so in short, when we eat something with carbohydrates, and there's two types of carbohydrates. We have complex carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates. When we eat both of those, our body digests it into glucose, which is absorbed into the bloodstream. And then the body uses insulin, sort of like a lock and a key, to open the cell and let the glucose in for energy. Um, and so that's important to understand for this next part because it is true that sugar does feed cancer, but sugar feeds every single cell in our body. And even if we took out all of the sugar and all of the carbs out of our diet, our body would still find a way to make an energy source from protein and fat or stores in the muscle, stores in the liver. So we think, though, that maybe a high intake of sugar over time and eating lots of simple carbs might influence cancer cell growth because of the body having to produce lots of insulin to absorb the sugar and also the growth factors associated. And so um, I have this quote up there from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Oncology Practice Group sort of talking about that. So then we get into um, the issue of, okay, so we really, if somebody's able to eat a normal amount and eating normally, then we do want to limit simple sugars so that we're not um, causing the body to overproduce insulin. But maintaining weight is the most important thing because if somebody is not healing from surgery or not able to tolerate their chemo because they're avoiding simple sugars, then that is, that's more detrimental to them. So maintaining weight first. Then helping to help this um, insulin, I guess, problem, not putting out as much insulin when we eat carbs. Um, the idea is to put carbs with protein and fat. So trying to, to balance out meals and snacks. So I have a few examples up here. Um, this first example, apples would be our source of carbs, but apples have natural sugar, they have fiber. And then if we add peanut butter, that adds some fat and some protein so that the sugar is not absorbed as fast. The body doesn't need as much insulin to absorb the sugar from that apple. So there's more examples under there. But the, the reason for bringing this up is taking that fear out of, you know, your family says, let's go out for ice cream and being worried that sugar feeds cancer if I go out for ice cream. It's not necessarily true. Um, the fourth question was about side effects. And so I've got some little tips up here um, in relation to the most common side effects. Um, the first one, poor appetite or getting full quickly. Um, and I think with all of these side effects, one thing that we say over and over and over again to people is small, frequent meals eating every one to three hours and being consistent. Being consistent and using the clock to tell you when it's time to eat something else. Um, fatigue, um, one of the first things we look at when somebody has fatigue is are they getting enough calories and protein? Because weight loss makes people really, really tired. Um, so that's sort of the first place that we go. And then after that, it's about preparation, making preparation of food easier, having food, non-perishable food around that's easy to grab, 
um, to munch on when that clock hits and it's been two hours and it's time to get something to eat again. And then some other side effects. Um, you guys have, might have heard some of these already, but for nausea and vomiting, um, nausea is worse when the stomach is empty. So that's why it's important to always keep something small in the stomach. Um, eat cool, light foods. Eat after your nausea medications. Um, don't be in the kitchen when somebody is cooking dinner. Um, and then dumping syndrome is sort of a complex one. And if this is something that you feel that you struggle with, I would encourage you to get with a registered dietitian and, and get some ideas and some tips. But in general, again, this small, frequent meal idea, chewing foods really, really well, um, limiting foods high in fiber, so not eating whole grains, eating white grains, um, choosing low-fat foods and limiting sh simple sugars like um, juice or sports drinks, ice cream, that kind of thing. And then malabsorption. And so um, pancreatic enzymes are common for malabsorption, but if you're not taking pancreatic enzymes and you have um, and you are malabsorbing, then following a low-fat diet, which is less than 75 grams of fat per day. But then um, you may also try MCT oil. And MCT stands for medium chain triglyceride. And it's just a type of fat that's um, digestible without those digestive enzymes to digest other types of fat. Hopefully that made sense. So it's really easily absorbed. And coconut oil is actually a natural source of this. And it's funny because coconut oil is like all the rage lately, but it's a saturated fat. So um, for the average American, we say, well, olive oil and canola oil is better. But in terms of malabsorption, coconut oil would be the best choice. Um, maintaining or gaining weight. So um, we get a lot of questions about this. And again, the most important thing is to do that small, frequent meals and be really, really consistent. Um, sometimes keeping a food journal can help because it just increases awareness about, um, oh, I, you know, I guess I didn't eat something between breakfast and lunch or I didn't eat as much as I had thought. We are, as human beings, we're really, really bad at estimating portions and and estimating how much we've really eaten. So a food journal can help really tell us. Um, try not to eat anything plain. So adding lots of toppings to foods. So um, the easiest example is like a sweet potato. If you were gonna eat a baked sweet potato and put some butter in it. But it'd be better if someone was trying to maintain their weight, burning lots of calories, or they were trying to gain weight if we had butter and some type of bean, chili, and cheese, and sour cream, so that we maximize as much nutrition in that small amount as possible. Um, use nutrition supplements, shakes, and smoothies. Um, eat food first and then drink beverages so that you're not feeling full of liquids and you have room for the actual calorie and, and proteins. So the last question was about supplements. And this is also a question that we get asked on a daily basis. What supplements should I take? Should I take supplements? Um, we know that nutrients in food are more powerful than supplements. And um, research has demonstrating, demonstrated this to us. And we don't know exactly why this is true, but it's something about how the phytochemicals and the vitamins and the minerals and the fiber digest with the food together. They work together. So that's always the goal, is to get those nutrients from food, get turmeric from food, get the omega-3s from food, um, that sort of thing. But there are some cases where supplements are indicated. So the most common um, are those at risk for vitamin D deficiency someone who needs more calcium or vitamin D um, because they can't get it in their diet, 
um, or someone who doesn't have proper absorption of vitamins and minerals, they might need extra supplements. So w if you do need supplements, um, the tricky thing about supplements is that they're not regulated. And so um, what is said is in a supplement could not really be true. There could be other contaminants or it could not release correctly when taken, et cetera. So if you look for this, oops, excuse me, this NSP, or sorry, NSF or USP label, that means that it's the supplement has been tested in a laboratory and it contains what it actually says it contains. So that, that's useful. Um, but this is really a place, it's individualized. Ask your doctor, ask your pharmacist about um, drug interactions or your registered dietitian about specific supplements that you're interested in. Um, here are some resources if you need more. So um, this book, Eating Hints Before, During, and After Cancer Treatment, is a great book um, for side effect management. So it's got multiple food lists, what to eat when you have taste changes, what to eat when you have diarrhea. So that's a good place to look. Um, Oncologynutrition.org is put together by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and they answer common questions like, why can't I take antioxidants during chemo? Or should I take antioxidants during chemo? Or should I be worried about soy? Should I eat organic food? Those kinds of questions. So that's a good place to look. Um, the AICR is a good place to look for um, healthy recipes and tips for eating a balanced diet. And then the American Cancer Society puts out some good books on nutrition. Um, nutrition for Cancer Survivors is good. Um, and then they have two different cookbooks, a healthy eating cookbook, and then um, what to eat during cancer treatment cookbook. So we have about seven minutes. I think we can take a few questions. Uh, one would be, you gave at least one example where it'd be particularly helpful for somebody to speak with a registered dietitian and so forth. Beyond the, the general healthy eating guidance that, that you've provided here, are there other s situations where uh, it would really be important or helpful for somebody to see a specialist, to get, uh, to get a plan that was really tailored to their situation, or in most cases, just be smart about it and follow these these guidelines? I think it's worth, um, especially in this situation, to get individualized guidelines because the tricky thing about talking about nutrition to such a broad audience is that it can't be tailored and specific to the type of chemo or the type of surgery or um, the diagnosis and whatnot. So it is worthwhile getting individualized information. Okay. The, the second question is, Again, pretty much everything you put out there to me falls under the, the guidance of, you know, be smart and healthy diets and everybody ought to be doing these things. Is it even more important to try to avoid a recurrence that you be even more religious about these kinds of things? I think so, um, particularly trying to include those plant-based foods because of the phytochemical benefit. and you know, sticking to that rarely category of processed meat, limiting red meat to 18 ounces a week, and that type of thing. So I agree, I think it is more important to be vigilant, but, the, but there's also a balance between becoming food obsessed. Um, and so 90-10 rule, 90% 90 of the time we're, we're doing our best, eating healthy, and then 10% of the time, we go out for pizza and ice cream and we have fun. But I already miss my salami, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, my question deals with basically being diabetic. So I'm gonna go back to your um, presentation on the sugars. If you can address it or elaborate more on the idea of, because you were talking about insulin, you were talking, insulin production I should say. Uh, you were talking then sugars 
and then how that can proliferate the, uh, the expansion of the, the cells or proliferate the, the cell growth. Um, so if you can elaborate more on that and kind of understand, you know, because I was never a diabetic until all this happened. Yeah. So it does depend on, you know, the regimen, but it's where counting carbs and really knowing how many carbs are in food becomes important because um, if somebody's eating a lot of carbs in their diet and they're, they're rel relying on insulin to, collect, to correct blood sugar, then they're going to need a lot more insulin to correct blood sugar and, you know, unless they were kind of sticking to a 45, 60 gram carb meal. So did that answer your question? Not exactly. Because uh, one of, the things, <laughs> one of the things you were saying is that, you know, and, and, the, and I heard this in the very beginning too, is that it's a myth. So is Sugar it and cancer. It, that that it pr promotes growth of the cells. So is it a myth? Is, or, you know, what exactly is going on here? I mean, I, I monitor my carbs very, very, very well. I mean, I'd stay at around 45 per meal. So my, my question is really trying to figure out, you know, okay, I'm taking so much insulin, I'm trying to understand really how is sugar really doing it? Do I need to cut back more? Do I need to be trying to get my carb limits down so much that I don't have to take as much insulin? You know, I'm trying to understand all that. Yeah, it's really if it was going to be in excess. So we talked that sugar does in fact feed cancer, but sugar feeds the whole body and it's the production of extra insulin that's, that's harmful. And so if you're being careful about your carbs and dosing, them, dosing your insulin accordingly, then you know, that's sort of like in a normal situation where the body is producing its own insulin, then that's similar. So it's when there's a lot of excess. And honestly, this is an area where we're doing more research. We're doing more research about the ketogenic diet as well, but we don't really know yet. That was the same question as mine was okay. the diabetic question. But okay. is, that, is that in reference to being a type 1 diabetic when you're giving yourself your insulin as opposed to a type 2 where you're just taking a pill for it? I don't know if there's a difference in that regard. Um, my question is more about type 1 diabetic where you are giving yourself insulin, and but I think you mostly answered the question. So. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be the same. Yeah. Um, for type 2, you know, the most important thing is to have consistent carbs through the day. But for type 1... You do have more freedom because you can dose insulin accordingly to how many carbs you eat. But the goal is not to eat lots of carbs where you're dosing lots of insulin. So it's the same. Yeah, good question. One more question. You touched on it briefly about kind of the food obsession piece. And I'm curious, how do you have the talk with someone when maybe they've taken something too far? And you want to put it in the context for them. So I think there's a lot of control people think they have, and food can control a lot of this. Um, how do you have that conversation that, hey, yes, there's that worry about diabetes, but there's also this needing to keep your body strong mm -hmm. so that it can do what it needs to do when it um, goes through treatment? I'm just curious if you have any tips or if you've dealt with that before. Yeah, it, it's really tricky. And um, the first thought that comes to mind is that there is no scientific evidence that diet can cure cancer. Diet is a means to support somebody through treatment, um, but diet and supplements can't cure cancer, and so it's, it's nothing to be obsessed over if it's not going to, if we know it's not going to cure and be a magic pill, so. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to find out, I have a few patients who um, suffer from metallic taste in their mouth. Do you have any dietary perspective? Yeah, so the first thing to try is plastic silverware. See if that helps. Um, or depending on what they're drinking, like um, I've heard Boost and Ensure can kind of do that metallic -y thing, so pouring it into a different cup helps. Um, but also experimenting with flavors, so adding more fat, adding more acid, adding something sweet can help balance those metallic flavors. Um, also cleaning the mouth before and after food helps. Thank you. Good question. Thanks so much, Katie. That was, that was great. Uh, 